Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Series, where we are sitting down with local elected officials from across this great country to talk to them about themselves, their community, and of course, their duty to serve. Today on the show, we are pleased to welcome five-term councillor for the city of Quesnel, Councillor Lorianne Rudenberg. Councillor Rudenberg, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. It's, uh, it's a real treat to be here. So, uh, Lorianne, uh, as you said, I'm okay with calling you that. Lorianne, um, where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Um, so, you know, I was thinking about this earlier, and it I, it started probably back when my kids were in public school, and I got involved with the parent advisory councils here. Uh, we had just moved from Ontario, and I needed to uh, find a way to uh, figure out the community, right, and and know where I fit in, because I knew where I fit in back in Ontario, where we moved from, but I didn't know here. So, you know, um, I got involved with the PACs, and um, I thought, you know, what can we do to make the school community better? You know, other than being the cupcake fundraisers and the hot lunch ladies, you know, what else could we do? So from there, kind of moved into the district parent advisory council, and then actually ended up at the provincial level, sitting at the president's table at the provincial level for parent advisory councils. Wow. And so it was kind of from there that I actually, I was asked by a sitting councillor um, who was running for mayor in 2009, if I was interested in running to sit on council. And it kind of intrigued me because I thought, so, you know, how could my voice benefit the community? So that's kind of where it started. So I, I've got I've got to ask the million dollar question here because as a fellow Ontarian moving out western, where in Ontario did you come from? So originally I'm from Aurelia, but my husband and I, with our two little ones, moved from Minden, Ontario. I literally have family in Minden. This is a small world that we. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, no way. Well, my father-in-law and uh, mother-in-law still live in Minden. So, oh, yeah. Small, small <laughs> we world. can talk about that later. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about that first election. Let's get. Let's jump back to 2009 when you were first approached by that councillor to run for local government. Had you ever wanted to run for politics prior to that discussion? Or was politics something that was so far off your radar that when someone approaches you, you go, not me? So I had never had any plans on running for politics. Um, I just was, uh, you know, involved in my community. Um, always, you know, volunteered in various organizations throughout the community, even from, you know, back when I was in Ontario. And so, what, like I said, when I was asked about this, it was kind of like, hmm, you know, this, I, I think this is something I could try. You know, it, it, you, you never know unless you try, right? And uh, so, like you said, here I sit now as a fifth term counselor. You, 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 you must have had an issue that wasn't prevalent to you in the city when you first decided to put your name forward, because really, you're you're shaking your head for those who are listening uh, via audio. I know, I know. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, well, people who are watching this are going, oh, okay, she's shaking her head. Um, so there was no issue that was on top of your mind that you said, I want to advocate for this issue when uh, I'm putting my name forward. You just wanted to give back to your community. That's that's right. Like when I think about that, I wasn't an issue run candidate. It wasn't like, you know, oh, my God, you're doing this wrong. I need to make it work better. It was more about, you know, um, so so how do we make things better in the community? How do we make, you know, how do we have safer streets and, you know, more recreation facilities? It was all those bigger picture items. It wasn't anything specific that made me decide that I wanted to run for council. Had you did you did you think you had a pulse on the the needs and wants of the community when you ran? Because you talk about the bigger picture issues that you said, OK, we want more recreation. But when door knocking, when talking to your fellow neighbors, I can imagine they had their own issues that they wanted to address. So were you surprised at some of the issues that you heard back then? And are you surprised still to the, this day after five terms? Well, in your fifth term still hearing issues that people have in your community that you want to try and help address? Um, it did kind of surprise me. And, uh, you know, it was, 
you ran the gauntlet when you did the door knocking from people who said, you know, no, I'm good with what council's doing. You know, they're wonderful to, oh my God, what the hell are they thinking? And it's kind of like, so as a, as a person who hadn't sat at the table, I went, so obviously, you know, people never run to do community harm. They always run because they know they have the best interests of their community. So it was like taking these concerns and going, okay, so when we go back to the table, if I was successful, I could say, listen, so this is what I heard. So why are, why are people so adamant about this not working? So it was, it was that door knocking was an opportunity to actually hear some of the, the big concerns because you all have your own echo chamber, right? You all yeah. have your friends that you listen to and you talk to and they tell you what they think about stuff. And so when you step outside of the echo chamber, sometimes it's really quite eye opening what, the, you know, what you wouldn't consider a concern is a concern in the community. Do you, do you find yourself falling into that trap these days or do you still try to do that outreach to different communities that you don't find yourself in that echo chamber? Because I can imagine I've spoken to new counselors to counselors who've been there since 1994 and they say the exact same thing. Sometimes you do fall into that trap of only talking to people that you know, and that's not how a counselor should act or how counselors should engage with the community do you find yourself engaging with the majority of the community or sometimes just the people that are around you oh no no i'm definitely engaged in the community <laughs> i haven't part of what i've never given up is that volunteerism piece in the community and so whether um you know i sit at the rotary table um I'm involved in a food security um, resource table right now. Uh, you know, all of these pieces are outside of what I would consider my normal, you know, group of friends. And so it still allows me that ability to understand what's going on in the community. I also work a little bit part time. I'm an executive director of a small BIA here in Quinnell. We have three of them. And so you know, it brings another perspective to the table. And I've also sort of engaged, I allowed myself to engage in the bigger picture. So I've been president of uh, the North Central Local Government Association. And I've just recently finished my term as president of UBCM, which is the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. And so when you talk about that bigger picture thinking and understanding what's happening in and around all of your communities, you're able to filter that back down into your own community. Uh, we're going to be talking about some issues prevalent to the city here in a few minutes, but I want to go back to yourself here. But then I want to go back to that very first election because you never forget your first time on the ballot. You never forget the first time you see your name on the ballot and you get to put that X or check mark beside that. For you, what was that experience like? And do you still get chills every time you go into the ballot box and see your name? So funny thing, Chris, I don't get to vote for myself. What? <laughs> I live just outside the boundaries of Cornell. And so I'm actually in the regional district. And so unless you own property uh, in the city, you don't get to vote, right? So there's only been one election that my I've been allowed to vote for myself because we had co-signed some property with our daughter. And so for me, I don't get to go into the ballot box. You know, I don't get to go to that <laughs> to that okay. table. Okay, you've just opened Pandora's <laughs> box that I want to play in for a few minutes. You're telling me in, in BC, you don't need to live in the area that you run for? No. No. Um, wow. So I live a 10 minute drive outside of the city. But what you know, what happens in the city affects what happens where I live, right? And so that's always been, you know, I've only ever had one person really question me why I would consider why I wouldn't run for regional district director, right? And at the time, we had someone who had been the um, our director here forever. And so there, you know, that wasn't a thought. So no, I live just outside of the, the city. Okay. So like I said, you know, the five terms, I've only been able to vote for myself once. So, so, I have to do so that, pretty that that first time you got to vote for yourself how how was that experience was it a, a surreal experience <laughs> well it it was interesting because um i've always you know i'd never seen the ballot with my name on it and i remember the first term you know you have to fill out all your forms for the the, the electoral officers and they said would you like us just to put Lori rudenberg down i said 
no, my first name is Lori Ann. And I said, look at it on the ballot. It's the longest name on the ballot. You can't miss it. <laughs> right. So when I got to go and vote, I went, you're right. You can't miss that name on the ballot. <laughs> Oh, Lori, yeah, this is awesome. Um, okay, well, uh, walking into council chambers then, as the elected official for the city of Quinnell for the very first time, surreal experience? Like, how much of a weight and responsibility did you put on yourself to ensure that the decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis or on a weekly basis best reflect the movement of Quinnell moving forward, but also keeping in mind the people who've elected you there. Right. So um, every first term counselor will tell you that it's a steep learning curve, especially if you've not been involved in politics at all. And so for me, it was not only learning about what the municipality was responsible for, but how we work with our regional district partners also, because that's the area outside of the community. But there are shared services that we have with them, things like recreation, et cetera, our, our landfill. And so it was about learning how those partnerships worked. It was about learning what was important for the community. Um, I, mean, I mean, it's a little different now, but I can remember our first meeting um, after the inaugural meeting, was about so what do you want to see for a tax hike this coming term and it was like but i haven't i don't even know what like how much does it cost to to run the snowplow this winter you know like yeah it was just one of those questions that was asked and you're sitting there going well i don't think anybody wants any tax increase you know which everybody would like to hear right you know zero across the board but we know that's so unrealistic in this day and age especially because you fall behind in so many things so it was it was a little um hair straight back but um you know i i lived off the adage of my dad who used to see you either go big or you go home so you you throw yourself into it you get out there in the community, you know, you get invitations to all kinds of events, you go, you participate, you know, you do the goofy fundraisers, you, you, you just make sure that you're out there in the community and you listen all the time, right? So besides that part, about getting out and listening to your community, what advice would you give to first term councillors? Because in BC, I'm just looking at the 2022 municipal election there was a high turnover. There was a very high mm. turnover of new councillors, new mayors coming into this position. While it's been almost 100 days since the last municipal election in Quebec, what advice would you give them to sort of get them up and running? And what would you what advice would you give prospective councillors who are thinking about putting their hat in the ring across Canada to make sure that they are good councillors, mayors, Reeves? So one of the things that has always surprised me since my first term as being elected, because what I did was when I made the decision to run for council, I made sure that for probably almost two months, I attended council meetings. I sat in the back row kind of thing and watched what was going on. I maybe didn't understand it all, but at least I was there to see how the process worked. Um, it really surprises me when people run for elected officials, especially in the local government level, and they've never stepped foot inside of the council chambers. Really? Not once before they, they run. And so I, I've i never understood that. I've never understood how, I mean, and a lot of them have issues that they were bringing to the table. They're running because of X, Y, Z. But to have never been in the council chambers itself, to understand the process, to, to understand, you know, um, how reports are given, how they're handled, um, always kind of blew me away. And it still does, even to this day. Um, because, you know, we had a fair number of people run this year for our council. And I would say mm, no more than two or three of them had ever been in council chambers. And it, and that, you know, over and above the incumbents and that it, especially knowing how, how, um, do you find, and I apologize for interrupting, but do you find, and this is not just Quinnell specific, because I know you're not the first counselor or mayor to say that, um, do you 
can you tell a good counselor if they have a pulse on the community by attending council meetings, knowing what they're talking about? Because I'm trying to figure out what makes a good counselor. What makes a good elected official in 2023? Is it someone who's engaged with their community or is it someone who knows what the rules packages the municipal government act the uh what how do how a policy becomes a procedure how a procedure becomes a bylaw is it that or what in your opinion makes a good counselor so it can be a package of all of that um you know there is so much information that you know we put on our our website that you can go and look at you can look at what our priorities are you can look at what our work plan basically is for the next five years you can can look at our major capital projects that we've got coming down the tubes you can go oh my goodness you mean we have to put a bridge and we have to do this number of streets and this how are we going to do that with a budget that we have so if you really want to be engaged as a person who knows what they're talking about other than just spouting off because you don't think that um you know joe blow street has enough street lights it's about understanding what the issues are in your community I think that's I think that is really important if you're thinking of being on in local government, right? And it, and I speak for regional districts and for I mean regional districts are a bit of a they're an interesting uh, creature of local government. Love them all to death. I work well. With, I'm the alternate for our regional district, but they they play on separate they play in separate roles, right? They play in a different sandbox than we do. We have two different sets of um, roles for municipalities and for regional districts. Um, but it's about everything that you talked about. But it's also knowing that it's about teamwork. You're not always going to agree, but how do you disagree and still be able to come out of the council chambers and be able to speak to that person the next day? It's about um, understanding governance because we have people who come in or think they'd like to run and they don't understand governance. They, but but at the same a, time, but at, a... at the at the same time, and I, I know we're getting diverted from our conversation, but I find this inter this conversation so fascinating so far. Um, governance and local government are two things that need to go hand in hand, especially the governance part, because you have to realize as the local elected official, you have one staff member. That's it. You don't have you, like the whole, like the whole city administration is not your uh, uh, staff. It's your CAO, CEO, or city manager, depending on what uh, version it is. How important is it to have a good working relationship with your council, but also that CAO to ensure that the movement of the city goes forward, particularly when you have councillors or a new mayor who comes in and says, I want to change X, Y, and Z, like you said, because that's what people elected me for, but then realize, oh, no, you can't do that because city governance says we have directions and policies in place that need to do certain things before we get to X, Y, and Z. So what people need to understand is everybody has one vote. Just because you're the mayor doesn't mean you have seven votes. You have one vote. Yeah. And the weak so mayor system. if you, yeah, if you have, um, if you have a, um, uh, an issue or a policy you'd like to see brought forward, you have to be able to present an argument to the rest of council that supports why you want to see a change yeah. and so it's about how to do that respectfully uh it's about uh understanding um when i say about understanding governance it's about understanding what an in-camera meeting means it's about how you make sure that you know um you uh recuse yourself if there's a conflict of interest it's about all of those pieces right and this is where so many what I've seen at the provincial level where um, local government gets into trouble is that people forget about some of those rules and they don't think they apply to them. And then other people are calling them out on it and then it becomes this whole name calling business or they start suing each other. And then, then the thought that you're going to be able to sit at the table and make decisions that are good for the community instead of what's going to be, you know, a pain in the butt because you voted against it for the guy that you don't like. Right. And you're not thinking about community then, are you? You're thinking about your own, your own self, um, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I want to turn back to the life of a counselor here for a few seconds before we go into our next segment. And that is the balance because local elected officials are the front line of government. They are the ones that are in their communities 24 seven. They don't get to run off to Ottawa or Victoria or Edmonton or Regina to govern. They have to be in their communities 24, not 24 seven, but they're in their community. So if you go to the grocery store, people are going to know who you are. How do you balance your private life versus your public life? Because as a counselor, you want people to engage with you, but as Lorianne, you want time that you can have with your family and some downtime to go out to a restaurant and just have a conversation with your husband or your partner. Right. And that is such a that that is such an important piece of maintaining your own sanity in local <laughs> government. Right. No matter whether you're um, a counselor in a small community like mine, you know, we're just over 10,000 or whether you're a counselor in Vancouver. So for me, it, it takes it takes a while to figure it out, I think, because you want to be everything to everybody. You want to, you know, if somebody approaches you in the grocery store, you want to be able to have that conversation and and, you know, let them know that you're working on something or that it's coming up at the next council meeting. But you start to learn that, you know what, so if I'm out having supper with my husband, because we have a date night, we do supper and a movie. And this, this is has been something that we've established for years now. And if somebody comes over to say hi, you know, hi, how's it going? Good. Yeah. Nice to see you. Yep. Likewise, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you know what? I can get back to you tomorrow. How about, you know, and then I, I'll have more information for you. I'll get back to you tomorrow. Are so people willing to, to accept say, that? Are, are are your residents willing to accept the fact that their their issue is going to be pushed off till tomorrow? Because I can imagine <laughs> well, when they think when it's, it's an a Friday issue. night, there's <laughs> on a Friday night, there's not a whole hell of a lot that I can do about any issue that's going to help them, right? Sure. If they want a sounding board, they 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 can leave me a phone message, they can write me an email, or I can call them back on Saturday when I have time to focus on what their concerns are. So. Um, I have found that that does work here. Okay. Um, you know, there are. Um, what about the social I mean, media people? Rudenberg. There's what only about... one Rudenberg in the book. So it's not like I can hide in the phone book. <laughs> right. True. Um, and <laughs> so I think that um, for me, I have learned too. Um, I mean, I didn't get involved until my kids were in high school. And so, but I still put, you know, when they had a football game or um, played soccer, I still made sure I was there. I always made sure that I did my family stuff because that's how important that was for me. Now I have a granddaughter oh. and, you know, my, my daughter and her husband, you know, Emma, year and a half old, love her to death. And that's, that is important for me to be able to do things and be, you know, went to her gymnastics class <laughs> last time I saw her. So, you know, it's, you learn to set your boundaries. Otherwise you drive yourself bonkers. True that. Right? You would. No. And I completely agree. And I can imagine the life because you want to do a good job in the role of counselor, but you also, like you said, you want your sanity to, be just grandma or mom or dad or grandpa or uncle and aunt. So I can imagine the balancing act is probably something you don't learn in your first year, maybe not even in your first term. It takes a while to accommodate yourself to or adjust yourself to that living as a political figure, but also as a normal person. So one well. of the worst inventions ever, I mean, it, it saved our butts during the, <laughs> the crunch of COVID was Zoom. Because most of us didn't know enough to say no. There was no way in a normal day in the life of a counselor that I would go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting, back to back to back to back. Whereas Zoom allowed me. And did I know enough to say no? No, because, you know, well, you know, I can. And and I probably feel really bad if I say no, I can't. I can't uh, be part of that. So, you know, love Zoom. And it has saved my butt. As, as president of UBCM last year, there were several council meetings that I could zoom into because I was away doing UBCM business. So, um, you know, sometimes you figure out ways of working around it, but you still sometimes have to learn to say no, even if it's convenient. Well, I'm very happy you said yes to me. So that's all that matters. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> Councillor Rudenberg, I'm going to uh, start off the second segment by saying this. This is a conversation between Councillor Rudenberg and myself. This is not an opinion of council. This is not a motion at council. This is her dis- opinion and talking to the cro- uh, host of the cross-border interviews. Because we seem to get a lot of comments whenever we ask this question. <laughs> um, Councillor Rudenberg, in your opinion, your opinion, not council, but your opinion, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Quinell today? Well, I thought about that too this morning. <laughs> Um, and, um, (laughs) I suspect that our issues probably resonate across the province. What is an issue here, you'll find our issues in communities across the BC right now. And so, um, I couldn't pick a number one. (laughs) I I have several here (laughs) just because there is so much happening and so much that's going on. So, um, I can start with homelessness. (laughs) We know that uh, we struggle with um, homelessness in our community. Uh, We struggle with encampments and what seems like our hands that are being tied by uh, more recent uh, court cases that have said, as a local government, if you don't have the, the right housing for these people, then you cannot take down the encampments. And so, you know, we had a large encampment on our riverfront Uh, walk this year and um, they were supported by uh, peer groups and other members of community that would bring them you know what their necessities and needs and whatever but we could not go in there and remove it even though it was on this lovely walk along the riverfront Um, what ended up happening was unfortunately it got it burned down um, I'm not sure whether it was a propane tank, whatever, but it did burn down. There was no loss of life, but we know that those people are now homeless, homeless again. Um, so homelessness is one of those pieces that we're struggling with and how we can work with other organizations within our community and at the provincial level. How do we increase the right housing? for for the people that are homeless because there's a whole continuum of housing right you go from your homeless to shelters to supportive housing there's a whole continuum and so we went through just before our election a huge um community discussion around the possibility of one of our hotels that were right in our downtown core going into supportive housing our community said are you kidding me and as a council, knowing that we need that that type of housing, um, we struggled, except for the fact that it was in our downtown core. And, you know, even though it would provide the supports that it would need for the people who live there, it was not going to help our downtown core. And so we had to say, no, thank you. We cannot do this. So, so now what do we do, right? Exactly. That was my, that was going to be my question. Now, what do you do? Because, and I, and I hate to jump in and ask this, the stupid question, but houselessness and housing is a provincial issue. And I think you and I will agree to that. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not fully a provincial issue. I think municipalities do play a role in it, but the provincial government needs to come to the table when it comes to issues around, um, social well-being and houselessness and they need to help municipalities address this as well how do you fix a problem that is on the feet of the municipalities but you need provincial and federal buy-in to help move it forward when everyone's so strapped for cash right now so uh, very very astute comment because that is part of the problem Um, Local government is dipping their toes into a pond that they never had to be in before. So we talk about homelessness, we talk about mental health and addictions. Those are pieces that local government, my first term, I would have said, what are you talking about? What do you mean having to provide homes? That's not what our taxpayers are wanting. They want the usual water, sewer, sidewalks, lighting, recreation services. What do you mean we now have to start looking at how we work with local partners and the provincial government? Because that that was who, you know, 
that was who was coming in to talk about the, the hotel piece. Um, how do we work with them to provide the services to help augment what is happening in our community? So how it do is you... tough. <laughs> it's about, uh, I mean, we so has creating has... partnerships. That's Ken. Okay. So you've been creating partnerships, but I, I've never been to your city before, so I'm going to I'm going to make a generalized statement here because I've heard from many different municipality leaders like yourself across this great country who say this. People want to help. People want to help the houselessness population, the homelessness population, the mental health, a mental addiction, a mental health and addiction population. But the issue is the nimbyism of the entire conversation. They want to help, but they don't want it in their backyard. <laughs> so they don't want uh, a housing complex that's going to house people who are homeless in their backyard. So how do you as counselor balance that act out? Because I can imagine as a local elected official, you want the best for your community. You want to put a, like a good step forward, but you also have to remember that the people who've elected you may not want that in their backyard. So this last housing piece that happened before the election, um, it's one of the few times in recent memory that I had people calling me to voice their concern about council's um, uh, options and what their decision might be. Um, and they were quite adamant. They weren't rude, they weren't ignorant, but they were quite adamant in how they felt it was not going to be um, the best move for our community. So, you're right. People, it is that nimbyism. People call it that because they see what has happened in the past with with housing um, opportunities that have gone forward. You know, not necessarily in our community, but they've seen it in other communities when you allow a certain continuum of housing and, and what happens to the community around it or the what the perception is of what happens to the community around it. So local government, you know, all we can do is keep making suggestions about, so have you thought about this particular area? Um, you know, one of the comments to us was, well, but this is the way, this is where we always put them. And it's kind of like, so, but, but you're getting pushback from communities all across BC because this is the way you always do it. So what is wrong with thinking outside of the box why can you not think of this particular area that was just outside of the downtown core? Well, because it's not close to the services. Well, then provide um, transportation. Well, but we don't do that. But, but change your model then. Change your model so that it works for the community. Don't think that just because you've always done it that way, that it's always going to keep being done that way because it's not working. And we were a prime example of that. You know, and there was this real push because there was this money available and the, the timeline was running out to spend the money to renovate the motel. And it was like this hurry up and rush thing. And it did not go over well with the community. And I know that it I've seen it across BC, th this play out over and over and over again. And you struggle because you know there's a population in your community that isn't being supported. But you also know there's a, pop a community, you know, that go, okay, we want to help but not at the detriment to the rest of us. And so the worst you know, thing that you can ever of, say to somebody is we've always done it that way. So that's why we're going to continue to do it. And every time I hear that from a politician, I want to scream at them so loudly. <laughs> well, and this, you know, this is, these are people who run other levels and not levels of government, but who work within the government, you know, other, uh, associations I, I don't want to throw the names out there but it's yeah, just no it's like but it's not working so yeah. how do you how do you change it to work and you cannot use we've always said this you cannot use the same model the same mold does not fit in every community That's does true. not and it will never so you said one of the top issues was houselessness what are the other issues that are facing the city so um an additional challenge for our community is the forest industry Okay. We have always been heavily, um, a, a heavily dependent community on forestry. And so um, we were at the epicenter of the mountain pine beetle epidemic uh, all those many years ago. 
and it forced major job losses throughout the industry. Um, and even now, our, our industry is struggling with the lack of wood and fiber supply. And so every time, you know, you hear about some of these, well, Prince George is an example, they've just lost um, a mill, 300 jobs. Well, that's 300 direct jobs. But for every forestry job you lose at a mill, there's a trickle down effect to at least four jobs that are at risk. So whether they're your, your haulers or your mechanics or you know, the guy who provides the lunches to, to the mill. So those pieces are hard. And I know that, you know, Wes Fraser is an, a, a big player here and they struggle to figure out how to maintain their presence in the community while maintaining their bottom line. All of industry is like that. And so we've, um we've actually have a forest innovation center here in Quenelle that looks at other opportunities how to um, to work the, la the the landscape instead of doing forestry like it's always been done? How do you create? How do you do it differently so that you don't have these big mega fires that are you know decimate some areas? Um, how do you make better use of what wood fiber supply that you have? Not that industry isn't already thinking of all these things. But this this particular office that we have, and it's part of the city of Cornell, is supporting how you know any kind of um, uh, of innovation ideas that might be coming forward. Uh, so you know, why aren't we manufacturing more wood products in in and around the interior, like in northern BC? We do we we do timber. We do plywood really well. We do pulp really well. Well, why aren't we manufacturing other things from our wood? And so you know, we know that is uh, forestry will never disappear out of Quinell, but it's it's going to look different, right? And so we've had to change how people look at Quinell and what we offer in order to entice other people outside of the forest industry to come and be part of our community. Wow. So that's a that's another one of those challenges that we have here. So I, I'm um, gonna I'm gonna interrupt for a second because you're you're laying out a very specific picture right now that there's a lot of is a lot of things going on in your community. The issue though is if I go talk to people in Quinell, if I go talk to a hundred people in Quinell, they'll all tell me something different. They may say the forest industry, they may say healthcare, they may say um, the first thing that you talked about. I'm sorry, houselessness, mental health, and addiction, but they'll also tell me their specific issue. That pothole in front of my house that hasn't been uh, fixed in a week. That pothole, that uh, that sidewalk that's been cracked for two years that needs to be replaced. That playground that's decrepit that needs to be upgraded. I'm not saying that there is. I'm just saying they might bring these issues forward. How do you as counselor and how do you as council, and I'm talking as the royal council, but not just you, Move the city forward, but also remember that the people's issues are the most important issues. While the city needs to move forward, you can't forget them. But at the same time, picking the winners and losers, because not every pothole is going to be fixed this year. Some might have to wait till next year because of budgeting issues or planning issues. Well, it depends on the size of the pothole, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So um, so we, our staff are amazing here. Um, they, they do a really good job on these five year planning cycles that we look at, um, our infrastructure. And so when we look at where our roads are in their life, um, expectancy, um, you know, so there's always this, they always, I can remember this out of my first term, they draw this line. So here's your, here's your, your road. It's doing really, really good, but you slowly see it starting to deteriorate. So you can fix it now for a small cost, or, you know, you can ignore it because you want that cost to go over here for something else. But by the time you get down to here, the costs have multiplied X number of times because now you're actually having to not only just fix the pothole, you now have to fix what's underneath the pothole because you've allowed the infrastructure to get so bad. And so with the way we do our infrastructure, we try to make sure that we don't get down here at the bottom where but sometimes you're, you're you now have to, fixing though, don't more than you? a pothole. 
Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does get down there because not every. If I I live in Calgary, so I know this for a fact that not every road is at pristine like before that no. dip, as you talk about. Some may right. get below that dip, and you may have to go. Okay, we have to do it now. It's going to cost a little bit more because we've been focusing on the water infrastructure, aging of our infrastructure projects. Maybe the rec center right. has to be updated. So. It, it's a balancing act, isn't it? It it sure is. And I mean, part of what we also do is we have um, water and sewer funds also so that um, every year money gets put into those specific funds to deal with any major, major upgrades or replacement projects that have to happen. And so that gives us that bit of a buffer so that, you know, we know we need to fix the road because it's kind of halfway down that that slippery slope of where <laughs> um, and all of a sudden one of our, you know, one of our water wells needs replacing. Well, because we've got that fund in place, we don't have to worry about taking the money yeah. from our road repair budget to replace the water well. And so, like I said, our staff have been really good. Our finance department, especially, she has been just amazing. And 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 it's taken her a while to get our council to that point because I, you know, when we when I first started, we were kind of starting that discussion, but we weren't quite there. Um, um and and it's tough, right? Because even things like recreation, um, you know. We know that if we have good recreation facilities here, it's a draw for families to come to want to live here. If they're, you know, if if we've got a doctor and his or her her husband and family want to come and move here, they're going to look at our facilities and go, okay, um, they've got skating, we've got a nice pool that's been upgraded, um, you know, we've got pickleball court. You know, I think this is a place that we could move to. If you don't have those pieces in place, then you don't get the people that that you need to come to your community to fill in essential jobs, which we all struggle to fill, right? Yeah. I want to turn to my last segment because I am cautious of time here, Councillor Rudenberg. And I want to start because as a tourist, as a tourist who, yes, I have not been to your community, but I am coming to your community this summer, because if you come on the show, I will be in your community for at least 24 to 48 hours to spend some economic development tourism dollars in your community. Um, so as a tourist or as anyone who's listening to this, who is looking at potentially visiting some communities in uh, BC or across Canada, what are some of the tourist hidden gems in the city of Quesnel that they should stop and see? Right. Well, <laughs> there are so many, but one of the things that we're really working on right now um, is basically our trail networks. And so we're not talking about just the river walk that goes around, you know, our entire community, including the two rivers and whatever. We're talking about things like mountain biking, hiking, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, walking. And so what we've started to develop, we we actually have what is starting to become as a world-class mountain biking um, trail system. And so, um, yeah, you'll, you'll have to check it out. If you go to uh, tourismquinell.com, you'll find all the information, a, a lot of these experiences. For those who are um, watching or listening, the link to that will be in the show notes. So please check it out. <laughs> excellent. Um, but we have, um, what we're working on is connecting those trails to our downtown core. So you can, you know, you can start in the city and you can, bike out to whatever level of biking trails you like we've got you know little pump tracks for the younger ones to learn you know to learn the the nuances of of mountain biking we've got we've got the ability to rent mountain bikes from our rec center now uh, you know wow. class a mountain bikes and so you know we've got skis and snowshoes that you can rent locally also to really enjoy the trails that we have around here and so that's a huge part of what our our tourism push has been because you know every time um I say this tongue in cheek, when communities used to suffer mill closures or whatever, one of the first go-tos government would say, well, look at your tourism. I'm sure you can, you can create tourism there. Well, that's great. <laughs> we, we have created tourism, and, but we still want our forestry jobs, by the yeah. way. <laughs> right. 
Um, so, you know, um, when you go on these trails, you can get views of the city, Dragon oh. Lake, which is another real tourist draw. And, um, and then we have a lot of other pieces. Hallis Lake is a uh, cross-country ski area where um, we've had some uh, world-class uh, cross-country uh, bi biathletes come out of. Um, talk about Dragon Lake. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie where they always were trying to catch Walter, the ever elusive fish Walter. Yeah. It's, it's an old, old movie. Well, we have Walter in Dragon Lake. He is a monster rainbow. <laughs> Challenge um, accept it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dragon Lake is really popular for fishing, um, summer and winter. Um, we go ice fishing all the time out there. Uh, it sounds and like it's there's wonderful. something to do for everyone in your community. Oh, there is. And then even just outside of Quinell, uh, the Bower and Lake chain, it's another world renowned um, uh, set of lakes where people canoe, kayak. Uh, I had a colleague who used to stand up paddleboard the chain. Um, so Barkerville is another area that's just, you know, 60 minutes down the road from us. Uh, it's just an amazing area. And then we have all our different, um, different, uh, what do you call them? Local events. So we have Billy Barker days. Now, Billy Barker was the guy who found the gold in Barkerville. So we have a whole family, free family event uh, in July for Billy Barker days. Uh, things like our Boot and Tooks event, which was our winter carnival last weekend. Even to, you know, like I said, we have three BIAs. My BIA, one of the things that we host uh, annually is our night market in August. So there, there is a lot of really interesting things. Um, we've done a dinner on the bridge. Uh, Quinnell has this uh, very long walking bridge over the Fraser River. And um, the two BIAs, Downtown Association and West Quinnell, hosted dinner on the bridge which we and then COVID hit so we haven't been able to do it again but we're hoping to do it <laughs> once again but it's, it's an actual <laughs> <laughs> right and it is a wood wooden walking bridge apparently it used to be the only way to cross the Fraser and the cattle drives would go over this bridge and whatever anyway very cool so what about yourself though after a stressful day at council after a stressful day at work where do you go to relax in the city of quinell and you cannot say your own house because i'm sick and tired <laughs> of hearing counselors talk about their house and how they get away from <laughs> everyone so for you what is the one place in town or the city that you can go and just decompress and let all your cares go away so ditto to what those other counselors have said but <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we have uh, we have uh, some uh, independently owned coffee shops here in Quinnell, which, you know, uh, in the summertime, they have outdoor cafe areas for you sit, go uh, sit there and I just have a cup of coffee. You know, quite often that's where people will come and stop and have a chat and ask you how your day is going. Um, we have a wonderful brewery here too, Barkerville Brewery. So depending on how stressful my day has been, coffee brewery coffee shop brewery <laughs> you just need to mix them just mix them <laughs> nice, That's right. I, nice well, cap. well i mean and the other piece is my family right my son and his fiance just live down the road from us um you know my daughter and her husband and granddaughter just live up the highway um those are my other decompression points especially my granddaughter um she just makes me laugh and smile so, you know, when I have a bad day, nothing better than getting a call from my daughter and listening to my granddaughters just learning to talk, go, Grandma. <laughs> it's just like, Aww. makes me smile. It's just, everything else just kind of disappears, right? Um, That is beautiful. But I'm going to end <laughs> on this question because this is this is the most important question that I ask every single one of the counselors and mayors who come on the show. What makes your city such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I like to think that this community, when called upon, is there for you. If there is a crisis within the community, um, people are there to offer help. Um, you know, I, I look at 
I look at how we dealt with when we had the fires back in 2017, 2018, and, and people were coming through our community to go up to Prince George for, you know, I'd like to think that uh, over and above being friendly, that um, they are a generous, generous community on so many different levels. And I see that in all the different types of volunteerism that I do here. And I see how, you know, people give of their time and energy and not just money and whatever, but of their time and energy. And I think that really helps make Quinnell, Quinnell. Councillor Rudenberg, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down with me for the last hour. Yes, an hour and talking about your community. I've learned so much about yourself and your community that as I said in our interview, I'm looking forward to visiting this summer and I'm looking forward to potentially grabbing a coffee with you to sit down and <laughs> talk about this a little bit more in depth, but in person, because like you said, sometimes in person's a lot better than Zoom. I agree. Well, like I said, I'm the only Rudenberg in the book, so you, you can't miss my number. And I really look forward to you visiting our community. I think you'll be it's funny because we have people who come through from Prince George and when they actually stop in Quinnell, they go, oh, I didn't realize you had such a great community here. And it's like, so when you stop and you actually look around, we have an amazing community here. Well, I'm looking forward to visiting. So with that, I want to remind everyone, put down social media, go have a conversation with somebody. It helps their society, helps our democracy, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.